Hello and welcome to the business of blockchain. I'm Nisa Amoyles. Our special series focused on AI and blockchain use cases is sponsored by Bitzier. Today we are talking about stable coins. I'm joined by Austin Campbell, adjunct professor at NYU, CEO at WSPN, who testified before Congress on stable coins. Welcome, Austin. Thank you very much for having me. This topic is so much bigger than people realize. We're talking about a financial instrument that you believe will reorganize the banking financial system, obliterate most global currencies while supporting the U.S. dollar. And Congress appears close to approving it. We'll dive into this, but let's start with the basics. What are stable coins? When we talk about what a stable coin is, it's the representation of a unit of currency on a blockchain. And there are many ways that this has been done so far. Currently, the dominant form are fiat-backed stablecoins, which means stablecoins backed by U.S. dollars, either in a bank account, in treasury bills, or in other forms of very conservative investments. Those are the most commonly used. If you look, for instance, at Tether, in addition to crypto trading, it's now being used for payments globally, and there are countries in Latin and South America where you can literally go to an ATM and buy Tether. So these have started to become mainstream payments instruments used for local commerce or remittances globally. Okay, now since you've testified before Congress, there's been something called the Genius Act. What are the main features of that? Okay, so the Genius Act is an attempt by Congress, in this case it's coming out of the Senate, to codify how they would regulate U.S. dollar stablecoins issued in the United States of America. And what they are doing is building a framework that allows these to operate safely and soundly. So the underlying rules are regulation of the issuers, roughly like banks or regulated financial companies, the rules around the reserves that they are allowed to hold to keep them safe and very clean. They look like government money market funds. And then rules around bankruptcy remoteness and operations, controls, and anti-financial crime so that these instruments can be used safely and globally. Okay, so why does the U.S. government care? How does this affect the dollar or the deficit? So over roughly the past two years, one of the largest buyers of T-bills has in fact become stable coins. There are now in the world over 200 billion U.S. dollars of them, super majority in T-bills. And in a world where buyers of U.S. debt at the foreign government level are declining, this is a counterweight. This is increased buying of U.S. debt, and that allows us to keep interest rates under control while running the kinds of deficits that we currently have in the United States. In addition to that, stablecoins push dollars globally into the blockchain system, making sure that dollars remain the standard for people who want to transact globally. And why do other countries care about this for their currencies? So U.S. dollar stablecoins are a very interesting innovation. All you truly need to buy one, if you are anyone anywhere in the world, is an internet connection and something of value to trade for it. What this means is that I can buy a stablecoin if I am in Nigeria, if I am in Venezuela, if I am in China. If I feel like my local government is not treating me well or fairly within my system, I can now opt into the U.S. system of rule of law and the dollar itself. So this is now, call it a competitive offering against every other currency in the world. Okay, and so how do U.S. banks react to this? So U.S. banks have reacted to this in, I will say, a somewhat complex way. Some of them seem to understand this is an extremely large opportunity to expand the reach of the dollar and are very excited about the technology. Others see it as a threat to their current competitive position, especially those with large payments franchises, or if we're going to be gentle, somewhat old school like deposit taking franchises that have not been modernized. So it is both a threat to legacy business models, but a large advantage going forward to those who adopt the technology, honestly, much like the internet was for mm -hmm. banking. Okay. So with the likes of Fidelity and other big financial institutions looking at issuing stablecoins now, what, how, man, how many can the market bear? Well, global M2 is tens of trillions of dollars. And if we remember that stablecoins are really just the representation of currency on a blockchain, the answer simplifies to how big is the global financial system and what is the demand for dollars. 
And how big is the market now? And stable coins currently are about a little over two hundred billion dollars. You know, it depends on the day how you measure it, but that's a good quantum for where we are. And the only issuers currently have been very crypto native. Mm -hmm. So the two largest are currently Tether mm -hmm. and Circle. Mm -hmm. And I would say the only mainline financial company that's jumped so far is PayPal, mm -hmm. who has issued their stable coin and only really now started ramping up operations in that. However, that's because of the lack of clear U.S. regulations around how to issue and utilize these things. If something like Genius or the Stable Act, which is the House version, passes, I would expect many larger financial institutions to start exploring this. We already see Visa looking at it. We already see Stripe. You hear rumblings about Bank of America, Fidelity, as you mentioned. Those are big names mm -hmm. with big balance sheets. Mm -hmm. Is it true that stablecoin volume surpassed Visa payments in 24? Yeah, yeah, so if you look at on-chain transaction volume, so just the exchange of stablecoins on-chain, it is quite likely that the total exchange of stablecoins surpassed the volume on Visa's network in 2024. Now, caveat, those are not entirely comparable. Visa is purely paying for things. Stablecoins also are used for settling forms of trades. Mm -hmm. So the use cases overlap but are not identical. However, that's a pretty clear statement that this technology is being adopted and continuing to accelerate. And on that point you raised, it's also interesting that starting in 2022, stablecoins started to decouple from crypto trading volumes because the old saw was these are only for crypto trading. Mm -hmm. Now it's relatively clear from data you can observe on public chains, these are being used for payments. Right, okay. So with Stripe's acquisition of Bridge, do you expect more consolidation in this area? I think there will simultaneously be consolidation. Large firms, it's often easier to innovate by buying small to medium companies than it is to start things yourself. But also I expect more startups and experimentation. Again, if we think to parallels of the internet, after the 2000 bubble burst, people didn't just walk away and stop using the technology. There was in fact more and more experimentation that has led us to where we currently are today, where, quite frankly, tech dominates the economy. Mm -hmm. So here, the gravitational pull of technology and global communication is now finally drawing in the U.S. dollar financial system. Right. So you expect this to drive more adoption of crypto and Bitcoin in general? Uh, definitely more adoption of blockchain technology. Whether it leads to adoption of any specific form of cryptocurrency, I think, will matter on a case-by-case -case basis. Bitcoin, I am relatively confident about. If you look at current markets, electronic markets, a lot of gold trades as a store of value for people, even online. Bitcoin is in many ways the same. And that, as a crypto asset, I think is synergistic with dollar stable coins. People will spend money and pay for things in dollars but can store value in Bitcoin and transition between the two. Other crypto, I think it's less clear. We're very early in that space. That's mm -hmm. not an endorsement or a criticism. Not financial It's just advice. saying that yes. we're early. Yes, okay. So what about the consumer experience? Will we need one wallet or interoperability here? I think to some extent what you're going to be experiencing is moving away from an account-based system where I have to go to every individual bank and onboard time after time after time to use their services to an identity-based system. So it will, to some extent, transform the consumer experience. I don't have to onboard with Circle to receive USDC or even to send it to somebody as long as I'm not doing anything that flags sort of their anti-financial crime or fraud regime. And so this will allow users, a little bit like the thesis of the open banking movement, to have more control of their identity, their accounts, and their money. So yes, I do think it will restructure consumer experience. The other important part is stablecoins are not fractionally reserved. For every dollar in a stablecoin, they're going to hold a dollar of assets and are not going to be lending or rehypothecating those assets. That also gives consumers a safe place to purely use the system for payments which means new types of form factors will exist and new consumer products can be created. Are there any risks associated with consumers or governments here? I mean, there are always risks in financial markets. As you move into new technology, could we have problems with blockchain operations? Solana has had outages. This is a thing that occurs. Could you have problems down the road with liquidity within stablecoins matching a 24-7 blockchain system to a banking system that's open roughly eight hours a day, five days a week. Yes, 
So there will be teething, there will be some risks. Do I think these risks are going to be as significant as the levered lending risks in traditional banking markets? Probably not, and that's part of why I see this system inexorably rolling forward. So what platforms will these stablecoins be built on? Okay, so if you look at the current crypto market, our major platforms are the large exchanges, the Coinbases and Binances of the world. And then if you look at traditional markets, we tend to have banks doing the majority of our payments work and occasionally some fintechs. I think as time moves forward, we're going to see an evolution where these types of entities all converge in some way on chain. Keep in mind a blockchain is an open access global omni ledger. Anybody can use it to trade anything that is tokenized on that blockchain. Meaning that in the current market, if I want to buy a stock and my money is on Coinbase, I've got to send it from Coinbase to my bank, to my broker. In this market, I can just swap through a stable coin in a matter of seconds to minutes at most. So I think what it's really going to do is turn everything into a unified platform over time. What is your hope for the future then with stable coins? What does it look like? So I think if stable coins are adopted well, we're going to see a number of things happen in global markets. One is that settlement costs will go down, settlement times will be greatly reduced, and we're going to have a fundamental restructuring of the banking system. As people have a system that is better, faster, cheaper to use for payments, that doesn't expose them to credit risks they don't want. Two, as I said earlier, almost anybody can get their hands on a US dollar stable coin. It will start serving as a floor globally for monetary policy because if you've been just a regular citizen in a place like Venezuela, your government has treated you terribly from a rule of law and inflation perspective compared to the US system. Because whatever critiques we have of the United States, many other places have been worse. This allows us to export U.S. dollar norms globally. Mm -hmm. And then finally, as a result of that, with things moving publicly and on-chain, I actually think in the long run, this will be a turning point for anti-financial crime efforts, right? If you look at who knows more about you, a small bank that you bank with or Facebook, it's almost always Facebook. And moving financial transactions on-chain and to a system that works more like a social graph will allow us to better find scammers, criminals, and bad actors over time. The tools are still early there, but I have faith we will get there. Wow, what, how exciting. This is just beginning to unfold. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you very much for having me. That's it for today's edition of The Business of Blockchain. Our special series focused on blockchain and AI use cases is sponsored by Bitzier. I'm Nisa Amoyles at the New York Stock Exchange.